Hi everyone, I'm Bianca Goladriga. 21-year-old Dylan Roof now faces nine counts of murder in the massacre of nine members of a historically black church in Charleston, South Carolina. Ruff reportedly confessed to police investigators and also stated that his goal was to start a race war. Flags throughout the state of South Carolina are flying at half mass in the wake of the massacre, with the exception of the Confederate flag on the state house grounds. That continues to fly high. Congressman Mark Sanford represents the people of Charleston, South Carolina, and joins us now. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to get to the issue of the Confederate flag later on in our interview, but I want to begin by asking you about how your community is doing right now. You served alongside Reverend Clementa Pinckney for eight years in the South Carolina State House. Tell us a little bit about the man that he was. Remarkable human being. Um, you know, there's that notion of people have faith, but the question is, do they walk in that faith? And he absolutely did. Um, he had a uh, gravelly, deep voice, but it, it really fit with uh, the gravitas uh, that he carried when he walked into a room. So he was a remarkable community leader. He was a remarkable religious leader. Um, it was a real compliment to him that he would be chosen to lead this uh, historic uh, uh, church. I mean, th th this church uh, has um, real significance, not just in the black community, but within the, the larger community of Charleston, given its history. And how is the Reverend's family doing this morning? Uh, as one would suspect, uh, again, still in shock and dismay. Uh, as a father, I cannot imagine um, having to go through that kind of experience with any loved one. Uh, and, and so time heals, but there needs to be some time. And uh, I think the, the first step will be the, the funeral service and uh, a lot of a eulogy to a great life well lived, but it wasn't just his life that was well lived and cut short. It was, as you noted earlier, eight other lives that uh, were tragically cut short. Eight, eight other innocent lives that were tragically cut short. Dylan Ruff has been charged with nine counts of murder. Uh, Governor Nikki Haley said this morning that if he's found guilty, he should be put to death. Do you agree? Uh, I do. Um, one of the things I, in essence, like the least during the eight years I was governor were the executions. There is something... Uh, incredibly sobering and sad about uh, the end of life and witnessing that process. But in this case, if it's going to be administrated, this would certainly be a deserving suspect. I mean, the fact that he has done this, the fact that he's acknowledged and admitted that he's done this, to me, it absolutely cries out for the death penalty because this is, this is premeditated malice at, at, at an astounding level. I mean, to get in your car in Columbia, South Carolina, which is 100 miles away from Charleston, pick out a historically significant black uh, church, uh, go to a Bible study there, uh, worship, or I don't think he was worshiping, but, but be with the, the, uh, the other folks in the Bible study for about an hour and then pull out a gun and shoot, in essence, everybody in the room is just, uh, I mean, disturbing level of evil and malice, and um, I uh, think he needs to be brought to justice. It's incomprehensible to, to understand what was going on in this 21-year-old's mind, but of course the nation is once again grieving from a mass shooting at the hands of one of our own, one of your state's own. And in John Stewart, a lot of people are talking about how he addressed the issue on his show last night. I want to play a, a clip for you before we discuss it. We invaded two countries and spent trillions of dollars and thousands of American lives and now fly uh, uh, unmanned death machines over like five or six different countries, all to keep Americans safe. That's got it, we, we gotta do whatever we can, we'll torture people. We gotta do whatever we can to keep Americans safe. Nine people shot in a church. What about that? Hey, what are you gonna do? Crazy is as crazy is. What are your thoughts on that? I think a lot of people would argue, Congressman, that if nine people were shot in a church or anywhere in a shopping mall in this country at the hands of an ISIS terrorist, uh, we would have a different response. Do you agree? No, I think that this person will be, uh, I mean, I, I 
saw the South Carolina plane that picked him up in North Carolina last night. Uh, I think he will be uh, fairly swiftly brought to justice. I think the death penalty will be administered in this case. I don't think it's one bit different if a terrorist was to come. I, you know, I, you go into a whole separate debate on indefinite detention, which I, I do find troubling, and that's a larger conversation. But, you know, if somebody uh, has killed somebody, I, I, I think it's, it's uh, whether you're a terrorist, whether you're a non-terrorist, whoever you are, the idea of bringing you justice, I think it needs to be done, and I think in this case will be done. Would you call Dylan Ruff a terrorist? Would you label him as a terrorist? No, uh, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I so think what's the difference, terror goes I guess. to the larger notion of a political agenda. I mean, I don't know what the difference is. I know what he is. He's a bad guy, and he needs to be brought to justice. That's all I know. Well, um, as to what went on in his head, I don't know. I, you know, I, I think ultimately in life we're to be judged by our actions. Some days we do more magnificently than we ever could imagine. Other days. Uh, we disappoint ourselves and our God, and there are consequences. In this case, there are going to be severe consequences. Well, you hear from his friends, um, schoolmates, uh, associates, who, who say that the clues were there, and, and especially over the last few years. He said he wanted to start a race war. Uh, he said as such to, to those who were witnesses within the church, the one woman who he let go free, to, to tell the world why he was doing what he did. Uh, what does that say about the state of race relations in in your particular state and in the country as a whole? Well, it says he was a crazy guy, and he's put himself in deep trouble that I don't think he's ever going to climb out of now. Um, it, it says that he was misguided, and I don't think we'll succeed, because when I got back from Washington, D.C. yesterday afternoon, Last night I went to a, a, a service and afterward the participants walked down to the Amy Church and they laid flowers and people were lighting candles and whatnot. And it was unbelievable uh, for me as a, 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 you know, a, a local guy from the low country, seeing people from all walks of life, different creeds, different ages, different income brackets coming together and, 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 and coming together really in solidarity about the idea of this guy is not going to win. So if his idea was a race war in Charleston, I would have invited you to come down and see what I saw last night, or I suspect what you'll see tonight at the larger community service that's going to take place at 6 or 7 tonight. And, you know, you, you say this, and of course that state has so much to be proud of, and bringing everybody of all races and backgrounds together is a, is a must right now, and we're seeing a lot of that play out. But yesterday I interviewed one of Clementa, uh, Clementa Pickney's um, colleagues, former colleagues, who said something that stuck, stood out in our mind, and that was that it's not safe to be black in a church in South Carolina. What do you say to him? I, I, don't, I don't know who's him, who him is. A, a congressman, a former congressman who was a longtime friend of the reverends uh, and now an attorney it, it gave us that statement yesterday when we spoke with him. Well, I mean, I guess there, I'd put it on the category of their differences of opinion to, to go around. I mean, if you were to go to, you know, the little church in Sheldon, South Carolina, the little church in Dale, South Carolina, or a whole lot of churches in Charleston or North Charleston, I don't think that that's accurate. I mean, I don't think that this guy, you want to talk about terror, should win from the standpoint of infusing fear into every black church, white church, mosque, synagogue, go down the list. I think that if, if, if we take that as the takeaway from this, then, you know, part of what this young guy was after, uh, he wins. I don't think he deserves to win. Um, so it's not representative of what I have seen. Uh, obviously, I'm a white guy, so I can't speak to whatever it was that uh, your, your panelist was alluding to directly. But what I can say in the black churches that I've been to, and I've been to a lot of them, eight years as governor and previous time in Congress and now time back in Congress, is that there is an incredibly joyful, spirit-filled um, feeling to, to, in essence, every black congregation that I have been in. And I don't think that that is going to be diminished one iota with regard to fear or tamping down by some deranged uh, kid uh, from Lexington County who drives 100 miles to, to do what he did the other night. So you don't believe that your state has a race problem? I, you know, I, no, I, what I'd say is that every state has work to be done with regard to race, 
work to be done with regard to economic well-being, work to be done with regard to health and wellness standards. I mean, in other words, there's work to be done on all fronts. But what I would say is I don't think we can pin it on one thing in terms of cure. And part of the formula for cure that I did see just last night was people, you know, Reverend Evans gave a great talk and he talked about the book of Job and how what Satan had intended to, to, to pull Job away from God, in fact, brought, God, brought Job closer to God, I think may well be what we see here. And what I heard people talking about is, you know, in my reflection in the wake of this tragedy, one of the questions I've got to ask is, what can I do to further race relations in not the country, that's too abstract, but in my neighborhood? or with my neighbor, or with my coworker? What's one little act of kindness that I might offer? And I think that if all of us do that collectively, we can go a long way to bettering race relations in this state, or for that matter, this country. And in, in bettering race relations, particularly in your state, the Confederate flag comes up in many conversations. It's a very sensitive subject that has a deep-rooted history uh, in the South. The head of the NAACP uh, just a few moments ago said that the flag has to come down. What are your thoughts? Lonnie Randolph is a dear friend of mine, uh, and uh, he believes that very, very strongly. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I talked to him as late as a couple hours ago. Um, what I'd say is it's, 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 a, it's a divisive and tough political issue. I'm not in Columbia anymore, but, you know, that was a political compromise that was reached. As with any political compromise that's reached, it's imperfect. Uh, both sides end up a little bit uneasy. So at the time, this took place prior to my becoming governor, but at that time, um, you know, the flag was taken off the, of the dome of the State House, put onto a place of a memorial there on the State House grounds, and concurrently there was a monument built to African Americans who'd suffered the indig indignities uh, and in many cases the death that came with uh, the, the ship passage from Africa to the United States and the slave trade. And, and, and so there was a monument built there. Those two things were done concurrently. Um, so I would say it's an imperfect political solution, but it was the solution that was put in place uh, a long while back. And, you know, if you took it down tomorrow, I, I think the, the question that many of uh, my friends, black or white, would say, you know, the $94 question is, what does that do to make my pocketbook a little bit stronger or my wallet a little bit stronger? What's it do? in terms of improving, you know, the roads by which I get to church or from church. I mean, I think there's a lot of economic issues that we tried to focus on, for instance, when I was governor. The other thing I tried to focus on was um, what could I do? And so, you know, I was the first governor to ever uh, recognize what was called the Orangeburg Massacre and apologize for it. Uh, first governor to uh, put in an African-American chief of staff, first American to put in, I mean, to put in, uh, first governor to put in a, uh, uh, African-American head of the Budget Control Board, the most uh, black members of my cabinet. I mean, I go down a long list of different things, but I was trying to do the things that I could do that would make a difference in improving the lives of black Americans in our state, and for that matter, white Americans as well. And this morning in an earlier interview, you had mentioned that having this conversation now uh, open Pandora's box with regards to uh, removing the Confederate flag, but couldn't you argue, despite the, the, the history that so many in your state have to, to be proud of with their family members dating generations back, that, that removing that could, could put people on the right side of history going forward? Now you're going straight into politics. I mean, uh, the right side of history going forward is, is one that, again, you could take a thousand people and you get a thousand different responses as to what the right side of history is going forward. And so, again, all I'm saying is uh, I think it's premature to have a big scale debate on the flag, on what are we going to do next on gun control, what are we going to do next on race relations when we've not yet even buried the nine tragedies of two nights ago. And, you know, these were folks in this community. Clementa Pinckney, as you mentioned earlier, somebody I served with for eight years of my life. I think that the appropriate eulogy to his life ultimately is let's eulogize the lives that were well-lived but cut short 
and then let's have these broader conversations on the three issues that you've mentioned and a whole lot of others and, as well. and I agree with you and briefly I do want to touch on gun control because of course our thoughts and prayers are with the family who are grieving now but as history unfortunately shows that at times like these we we do have these conversations that in other times we unfortunately don't uh, there have been 25 mass shootings in this country in the past 12 months alone the president alluded to the fact that it's something you don't see in any other developed country at, at such a constant and rapid pace. Do you think that guns in any way, especially getting into the hands of a 21-year-old that appeared to be legally, uh, that he received legally, uh, do you think they bear any responsibility? Yeah, but, but again, the $94 question is, what do you do about it? And that's where it gets deeply complex. I mean, there was an interesting Yale study that said, you know, one of the chief deterrents to to mass murders like this is concealed carry. And I turn it around and ask you, do you believe we ought to do more with regard to concealed carry so that one of the parishioners had a gun on them? What do you think? Yeah, it's a, it's a debate that many- I mean, it just gets horribly complex. And so I'd say, uh, we'll get into these issues. And, 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 and it, it, they are worth, had, I mean, this is a pause point, absolutely worth uh, further discussion. But what I'd say, we first got to do the first thing first in this community here in Charleston, and that is properly memorialize and commemorate lives that were well-lived but cut short. And what comes next for that great city of Charleston, for the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church? What comes next in the coming weeks and months? A whole lot of healing. A whole lot of healing. Um, this is a church of remarkable, you know, fortitude. It's a church that was, you know, burned down, built back, uh, a church where people made early stands against slavery. I mean, there's a, a remarkable spirit in that church, which, again, says so much uh, about Clementa Pinckney being asked to, to be one of its parishioners. Um, but, uh, you know, in the aftermath of tragedy, uh, people do a lot of reflecting. They do a lot of crying, they do a lot of praying, they do a lot of thinking, and I think that's what we've got to, 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 to look forward to here as a community in the weeks and months ahead. All right, well, Congressman Mark Sanford, thank you so much for your time as the country mourns with your city, with your great state. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. And I'm Bianca Goldriga. Thank you for watching and stay with Yahoo News for the latest on everything we'll be talking about today.